So the issue before us is actually very simple. It's about greater public safety. We filed this bill to ensure that all drivers are trained, insured, and licensed, and that everyone knows the rules of the road. And we have data to show on, that safety has improved in other states after more people gained licenses and gained insurance. So after Connecticut passed a similar law, they saw 9% fewer hit and run crashes. In California, hit and runs decreased by 10% and saved drivers over 17 million in insurance costs. So I don't often quote insurance companies for inspiration, but in this case, I actually think it's appropriate. So Roberta Fitzpatrick from Arbella Insurance said of this bill, 16 other states have already passed this legislation. And in those states, the legislation's matured so we can look at data on public safety outcomes. We would not support legislation like this without doing our homework and studying these other states. She ends by saying, we think Massachusetts should join those other states. This will help to ensure that the all behind the wheel are tested and have the insurance required to keep all of us safe. Yep. That was State Rep Christine Barber. Speaking to the act relative to work and family mobility. We have Christine Barber here in the hot set today. Congratulations on the passage in the House. Thank you so much and thanks for having me today. So what does this legislation do? So this legislation is actually pretty simple. It allows all residents of Massachusetts, regardless of their immigration status, to apply for a standard Massachusetts driver's license. Um, so this is something that 17 states have already done um, and would allow people, um, regardless of their immigration status, to be able to drive safely and get a license and insurance. So this is a, uh, this is legislation that is affecting undocumented immigrants so that they can get documentation of who they are. How exactly does that work? Yeah, it's a great question and actually one that we got a lot. So calling um, people without immigration status undocumented is also is actually a misnomer. Mm -hmm. um, so people who are here, um, off, they have actually lots of documentation because they are asked all the time to provide documentation. What they don't often have is um, permanent residents here in the United States, legal permanent residents. They are folks who have been in our community for many years, but because of what we know is a broken immigration system at the federal level, have not um, often not been able to get uh, their green card. So what we require in the bill is actually a passport, and many people who are um, you know, here from other countries do carry their passport from that country or a consular ID card, which is sort of like a passport and something that a lot of countries provide at their consulate. Um, and a lot of the countries um, that immigrants are from here in, in this area um, have consulates in Boston, New York, uh, Providence, so people can go to their consulate and get an ID card and use that as their documentation to the RMV to prove they are who they say they are. Why is it necessary to give these folks uh, access to a driver's license? So um, there's, we know, especially after COVID, I mean, it's kind of been hit home, I think, in the pandemic more than even before, is that you often need a car to get to the doctor, to bring your child to get a COVID test. Um, to We know there were drive-through tests only for a long time to get a vaccine um, and to get groceries, to get to work that even in um, a place where we have good public transit, you can't always rely on public transit for some of the basic activities of our lives. If you're working odd hours, you know, the T doesn't run, um, you know, all the time and may not be reliable to get to your job. Um, so we wanna make sure that people have access to a license so they are able to drive. It is ironic that we're sitting here in Union Square where a green line is about to open, where we fight for bike lanes, where we can take four or five bus lanes that we're talking about getting people's driver's licenses. It is. All of Massachusetts is not as lucky as Somerville um, and, and as Union Square and um, other places with great public transit access. 
so for all of Massachusetts, we know that people do need to drive, but actually I heard from constituents here in Somerville and in Medford that this was their top issue. So many people fear being pulled over for driving without a license mm -hmm. and then being detained or deported and separated from their families. And it was creating huge fear throughout the whole um, community and that this is a tangible thing that we can do to try to address some of that issue. We use driver's licenses for so many other things. Um, you can even use your driver's license here to get, e to get your Somerville discounted membership at SMC. So uh, are these driver's licenses just like the one that I might have or the one that you might have? Um, are, are there any limitations on them? So they may not be like the one you have, they're like the one I have. So we have two, a two-tier driver's license system already in Massachusetts. There's the real ID, um, which we uh, went to a couple years ago, um, which many people have where you have to provide um, a lot of documentation to get the real ID. And you know you can use that to fly and for other things. What I have and what this will be is a standard mass ID, and that is something you need a, um, documentation, but a little different documentation, and it's just for driving. It's not for flying, um, not for boarding planes, it is not for getting into federal buildings and other things. It's purely a license for driving, but it's one anyone can get. So um, it is what immigrants will get, it is what many um, other residents have. So this is a fight that you jumped into. Um, what, what was the work that happened? Well, I should ask, why did you jump in? So um, this is something that's gone on for many years, for at least 17 years, well before I was a rep or worked on this issue. Um, activists and um, many uh, advocacy groups have been working on this for a really long time. Um, about three, uh, three, three and a half years ago, um, I sat down with Ben Echeverria from the Welcome Project in Somerville, and Natalicia Tracy, who runs the Brazil, ran the Brazilian Worker Center, does a lot of work here in Somerville as well. And we were talking about issues affecting immigrants, and they um, shared with me some of the stories of folks who had so much fear about um, being separated from their families because of driving without a license, and a license that they use to get to work and for you know basic activities. So they asked me to take a leadership role, um, and I reached out to a woman, an, another uh, representative, Rep. Farley Bouvier from Pittsfield, from the other side of the state. She had been working on this issue, and she was very gracious, and um, we partnered up, and it's uh, been a, a great partnership to work on with on someone else with someone else on. And then I met the Driving Families Forward Coalition, which Natalicia and Ben are part of, and it's this incredible coalition that, that just came together a few years ago just to focus on this bill. And they're um, mainly labor leaders, but also faith-based groups, of course, immigration activists, people who are directly affected by this um, bill. And they have done an incredible job organizing throughout the state on this issue. Um, but really, I. People in Somerville and Medford have been um, leading on this issue and pushing, and I'm just um, so grateful for all their work and how I can partner with them. It's interesting how you have uh, you you have some labor uh, voices behind this. How is this a labor issue? Yeah, so this is actually uh, this bill is a one of the top priorities of the AFL CIO here in Massachusetts, and labor has been incredibly strong on this issue. Um, the reason is uh, that driving is essential to getting to work and to economic mobility and that honestly for many members and labor is always good with solidarity and other workers in the community who may not uh, yet be union members um, that they know this is a, a incredibly important work issue for for families so um, labor has been a really strong partner in this this wasn't a slam dunk in the house um, your, your colleagues were, were somewhat concerned on, on some of these issues. Um, Representative Paul Frost of Auburn said that this is encouraging illegal immigration. He also hinted that this would lead to voter fraud. We're able to uh, register to vote uh, via the registry uh, when we uh, update our licenses. How is that 
what prevents that from happening? Mm -hmm. So on the voter question, this happens already, um, where many people have a license and cannot vote. So many people have a green card um, in Massachusetts. They're a refugee, they're a asylee, they're here, they have legal status, they have a license, and they don't vote. The clerks are very used to this. Um, but we were hearing that question a lot, so we actually put a special clause in the law, even though it's redundant, um, stating again that this would not allow people to vote. So we tried to be really clear. Um, and when you say it wasn't a slam dunk, we did have, we did pass this bill with a veto-proof majority in the House. People, uh, many people told me um, I was kind of crazy and even trying to meet that goal, and it took, um, honestly, a number of years, but especially over the last two years, many individual conversations to um, mm -hmm. get people to realize that this is a public safety bill. This actually benefits all of us on the road as drivers. Um, making sure everyone knows the rules of the road and has insurance helps, helps me as a driver, but also helps um, everyone who's on the road, not just the immigrants who are getting licenses. You did eventually get a lot of backing on this. You had 80 co-sponsors? Mm -hmm. What's average for a, a bill in the House? So there's 160 members of the House. Mm -hmm. So average, I mean, I have some bills that only have a handful of co-sponsors. Um, we really organized on this. And I have talked to every one of 159 of my colleagues about this bill. Um, we had we knew that it is ve it's very likely that the governor will veto this bill. He has said a number of times he's mm -hmm. threatening to veto it. So we didn't just want a simple majority because the goal of this is to get a license in people's hands. The goal of this was not to take a vote and symbolically show that some you know people care about immigrants. The goal is to to get to this benefit. So we worked really hard to get to a veto-proof majority, and that took a lot of organizing by the coalition throughout the state, and it took a lot of work um, talking to other members of the House to get them on board. So um, in the end, we had 120 um, out of the 160 voted for this bill, and that I never thought we would get there uh, a couple years ago. I thought maybe we could get to 105, which is the, the basic minimum, but 120 people um, was really strong. So what happens to this? Uh, well, you know, we've we've all uh, we've all know that this is a process. So what happens to this legislation now? Yes. So it is not law yet. So it passed the House very strongly. It went to the Senate. Um, I work with some great senators. On, um, so Senator Crichton from Lynn is the lead sponsor. Um, Senator Jalen championed this for many years, um, so she's a great supporter as well. And we're hoping the Senate takes it up really soon. Um, we think we have a lot of support there. Then it goes to the governor. The governor has previously said he will veto it. We'll, we'll see what he does. Um, but if he does, we, th we, it'll come back to the House and Senate, and we would then take it up. And we sh I'm hopeful we have enough votes to override a veto, but we'll, we'll see when we get there. Does Charlie Baker talking about how he's not going to run for office again, would that change this formula at all? Is there, is there possible he could be lobbied to make this easier? We've definitely had, we've had conversations with him. We're trying to get him information. The good thing is when he has said he doesn't support it um, in, in the news, he has said, well, I think people should have to prove who they are. Mm -hmm. So we feel like in this bill, we said, of course they should. They have to have documents. They have to have a passport or a consular ID. So we've, we've uh, responded to some of his arguments. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopeful that he won't veto it, um, but we'll have to see what he decides. Fantastic. So this is a, you know, I, this is just one of the many things that you've been doing. You've been, uh, you've been in office since 2014. Where does this rank as far as accomplishments? I mean, I have to tell you, um, this is pretty high up there, both working with the coalition and working in partnership. Um, and with people who are directly affected by this and, and hearing their stories. Um, 
has been an incredible experience. So um, I definitely want to see this bill get to the finish line. So you can ask me maybe then once it's once it's signed and people are able to get this benefit. Um, but uh, this was a was a huge victory. So um, I'm really just grateful for all the folks who've worked on it. Are there similar issues that you now need to that you you see now that you need to take up? Um, this. So I come from a, a public health and health background, so I always see this also as a health equity issue. Um, so with the pandemic, we know um, it's essential to get out, to get tested and get vaccines, um, and to be able to get basic needs like groceries. Um, so there are so many um, other related um, basic equity issues that I, that I am working on. So one is, um, working on, um, it sounds unrelated, but it is, I'm working on school meals and making sure that kids can get access to, um, to free school meals um, and trying to get rid of reduced meals, but making sure that there's free universal school meals for kids. So making sure that, that all families have kind of the supports they need to stay healthy. And that's kind of a basic theme of um, many of the issues that I work on. So you will be up for re-election this mm -hmm. November. Yes, I'm running for re-election. You are, yes. congratulations. So Bellapedia notes that you got 98.6% of the vote last time. Well, good. I think that was in the general, so I, um, I appreciate that. And um, ex Somerville and Medford are incredible, and I'm out talking to voters and look forward to you know, can, talking with more folks about what they want me to focus on and what's going on in their lives. What are the issues that you're campaigning on this year? Um, affordable housing is always the top one I hear about on the doors and a top priority for me. Um, I have been hearing, of course, a lot about COVID, but especially about the recovery. So what does that mean for small business? What does that mean for um, parents getting to work and making sure they have childcare to be able to do that. Um, and these are things that we um, are working on with the federal ARPA funding, but there's a lot more to do that um, we're trying to put together. So we are in a weird part of this pandemic, right? We, we've, uh, you know, it was mass on, then get vaccinated and then it, all of a sudden, Omicron is everywhere. Now that's come back down, and the state house is reopening mm -hmm. to the public. What are the changes for legislators now because of that? For legislators, um, we have been so the state house did just open this week, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, I, we have actually um, been in a lot over the last two years, mm -hmm. but there is an option to vote um, remotely over the phone. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been able to do that for the last two years. Um, for me, one of the good things is being out in the community more. So as you know, there just aren't as many events and ways to um, run into people and check in and see how things are going. So I started door knocking again, which um, I didn't feel safe during the earlier parts of COVID, but if you have a mask and you can distance and be outside, it's okay. Um, but just being out and seeing folks in the community is actually the, the best switch and I hope that we get as the spring um, rolls around that we can be out and have events and start to see each other a little bit more than we have been. This legislation, I know that the city of Somerville is looking both to the feds, there's the ARPA money, there are policies and whatnot. What is, uh, com what should Somerville be looking toward the state for help with the pandemic? Yeah, so we got out about uh, five billion. Remembering my my numbers right, five billion dollars in around Thanksgiving um, to improve public health, to affordable housing, um, to uh, locally, to um, to some food initiatives and um, homelessness initiatives, and. Um, that was kind of the first half of our ARPA money. Mm -hmm. We have another, I think, $4 billion still left. 
Um, and we're talking about how to best get that out the door and what to spend it on right now. The money goes, um, we have that chunk of money through the end of next year, it can be used through the end of next year. So, so the end of 2023. 2023. Okay. So there's a little time and I think we're trying to figure out the best way to spend what is a, a good amount of money, but there's so much need out there. We've had, um, I think, 10 or 12 hearings about the need. So we've heard from um, folks about, uh, especially about housing and about healthcare and about the hospitals and public health needs, of course, in the community. But we know for Somerville, um, there's so many needs and uh, we wanna make sure we're responding to those in the best way that we can. Is there a hierarchy of needs? Is there, are there, are there uh, particular things to focus on first? Yeah, so I think um, I've been really supportive of just, of, of course, to get the money out to public health, right? Mm -hmm. We need first uh, tests, enough um, testing sites for, for um, people to be able to do that easily. We've seen that be a huge issue. Some of that we need to rely on the federal government to be getting more tests out, to be getting more funds out. Um, but making sure that our community has good public health infrastructure, but they need resources. Um, but from there, um, just meeting some of the basic needs. So for childcare, housing, food, making sure people have the basic needs, um, their basic needs met. Uh, we did some funding for essential worker bonuses because for low income essential workers, they're the ones who've been getting us through this pandemic and, um, and you know, haven't, haven't seen a reward from that. So this is this is something that has changed. This was supposed to be a bonus for those who went to Market Basket or Target uh, to work because we needed milk. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those essential services, those were the folks who were supposed to get the payments. Mm -hmm. That's changed. I not that I know that it is. It's essential workers um, who are who are getting it. It is lower incomes mm -hmm. essential workers. There's an income guideline, mm -hmm. um, so it's only certain essential workers who are getting it. So like the the grocery workers, um, mm -hmm. that uh, and you know people who work at CVS, um, that those are the folks who are getting the payment. All right. So uh, we are here on the eve of another snowstorm mm -hmm. where yesterday it was 60 something degrees. Uh, we're getting what, seven, eight, 12 inches of snow this time. There's already been a, at this moment, at this taping, there's already been a snow emergency declared. So Somerville is famous for its space savers. Mm -hmm. If you shovel, you are not supposed to park in the spot right. where somebody else has shoveled. They mark this by saving their spot. Now, while I shall presume you don't actually have a space saver, be it a, 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 a traffic cone that says funeral on it or a, a wooden chair, what is the most unusual space saver you have seen in Somerville? So thank you. I do not use a space saver, nor have I ever used one. Um, happy to shovel out my neighbors if I can help. Um, so the, that's a great question. Um, I'm sure there's lots of ones out there, but the one that comes to mind only because what it made me think of was a high chair being used as a space saver. Uh, because I it was just an empty high chair, yeah, thankfully, yeah, but I no had kidding. this image of did someone have, yes, their child watching their spot for them, and that just seemed, you know, wrong. So um, don't use space savers, you know, be neighborly, mm -hmm. and let's hope we all get through the snowstorm and sleet storm. Yeah, it's going to be fun. February, not done with us yet. Right. Well, so uh, Representative Christine Barber with the bad news that there's sleep coming. Thank you very much for talking about the legislation. Congratulations on making sure we have work and family mobility taken care of. Uh, this is Kat Powers in the Summer Media Center. Thank you.